Hello and welcome to Game Set. Today I'm looking at some games to make the console that they're on look weak. This is kind of the opposite of the games that push hardware limits episodes as the games here pretty much do exactly the opposite. They don't take good advantage of the hardware that's available to them and the uninitiated might think that the console is less powerful than it actually is. Anyway, let's start with a game that can run on anything, or at least it should be able to. Doom is a game that's been ported to just about everything and anything. Calculators, ATMs, you name it, and it can probably run Doom. You know what can't run Doom very well though? The Sega Saturn. This game was brought to the system by GT Interactive and Rage Software and ported from the PlayStation version. They did not do a really good job. This package contains both Ultimate Doom and Doom 2. The first thing you'll notice is how bad the frame rate is. It topped out at around 15 frames per second at best and around 6 frames per second at the worst. Yeah, 6. Not only is this a powerful 32-bit console, but it's Doom, not something that's extremely complex, even for the time. You can feel the Saturn struggling with it. The frame rate is so bad that it naturally causes a lot of lag in the control, making it much harder to aim. It's also hard to steer yourself if you happen to be moving fast. It makes playing this a rather unenjoyable experience. Doom ran much smoother on the 32X, albeit in a smaller window. Still, even with all its cuts, that version is far more playable. Hell, even the recent version released for the Genesis that you can play on a Mega EverDrive Pro runs way better. This one usually runs at about 20 frames per second and a little more sometimes if there's not too much going on screen. This is pretty cool to be playing this on the Genesis, actually. Back to the Saturn, the troubles don't end with the frame rate. For some bizarre reason, the developers hard panned a lot of the sound effects. Your gunshots and grunts only come from the left speaker, while enemy grunts only come from the right. You can fix this by playing in mono, since all of the music is strangely presented in mono anyway. That's a real shame, because like the PlayStation version, the redone music here is outstanding. To only be able to hear it in mono is a crime. Seriously, did they not even bother listening to this in stereo when they were making it? Supposedly, this version uses some code directly from the 32X version in their rush to get the game out. That didn't help the performance of the game, even though they share similar Hitachi CPUs. The story goes that they originally made a custom engine for the Saturn, which ran close to 60 frames per second, which is faster than any other version of the game, including on the PC. But John Carmack himself didn't like it because he was feeling especially Carmacky that day or something. I think he didn't like the texture warping. So they ended up having to adapt the 32X's engine for the Saturn. John says that in hindsight, he regrets that decision. Good. Imagine buying a Saturn and Doom, rushing home because you know Doom is great and surely the powerful Saturn will do it justice. Then you're greeted with this mess. You'd think that the system is bad or maybe even worse than an Atari Jaguar. You certainly would never imagine that in reality the Saturn is capable of so much more than this. The Japanese version of Saturn Doom supposedly has a more optimized engine. But as I'm playing it here, I really can't tell any difference at all. It's still awful. I don't know what we've decided to say that the Japanese version was better. The bottom line is that the Saturn should easily be able to run Doom four to five times better than this hideous abomination. Speaking of Doom, the worst console port of this game ever is on the 3DO. It runs pretty choppy like the Saturn version and in the small window like the 32X version. Actually, it's even choppier than the Saturn version. The controls in this port are extra laggy. The game seems to have extra momentum applied to your movements, and since the frame rate is so slow, it takes forever for your inputs to register. 
I swear that sometimes there's a full second between when you press the A button to when your gun actually fires. It doesn't just seem like a second, but an actual real full second, maybe even more. That makes aiming your weapons a huge chore. As a result, playing this version was kind of difficult for me even when I knew exactly what I needed to do in any given level. So yes, even though the game is windowed, it still runs at a horrible frame rate. The good news is that you can punch in a secret code to get two more window sizes that are bigger. Oh man, oh man, this is bad. Rumor has it that this was ported to the console in only 10 weeks time. <laughs> I believe it. I've got to say, however, that after complaining about this port so much that the newly arranged music is actually pretty damned awesome. If you want the absolute worst Doom experience available on a console, look no further than the 3DO. In capable hands, the Saturn was an amazing console. Unfortunately, Sega didn't always let every developer have the best tools available. At least that's what a lot of them said in the magazines back in the day. As a result, a lot of third-party games on the system were suboptimal, like this next one. Another Saturn game that will make you doubt the system is capable of anything good is Hardcore 4x4 from ASC Games and Gremlin Interactive. This truck racing game is often a virtual slideshow when it comes to its presentation. As a game, it's pretty straightforward. Make your way around each track a few times and try to place first, if you can. This game is perhaps just a bit too ambitious for the 32-bit console generation. Thanks to the very contour terrain and the physics, there's just no way that a game like this could actually be pleasant on these systems. Yes, there's a PlayStation version, and yes, it's better, but it's still far from great. Makes the Saturn version look like trash, though. The frame right here makes even the original Saturn Daytona look fast and as smooth as silk. The control is abysmal, with tons of lag everywhere, which is unsurprising due to the low frame rate and wonky physics. Even if you pause the game, the graphics still don't look very good, especially with the lack of shading on the Saturn version here. The environments often just look like a random pile of giant pixels. The trucks themselves are shaded, and I'm wondering why they even bothered with that at this point. Even if the game speed increased by one frame per second by turning the truck shading off, I'd take it. This is another game presented entirely in mono for some reason, and there are no options to change it. There's also a really cool announcer who loves to say, whoa, hardcore, as often as he possibly can for absolutely no reason whatsoever. Whoa, hardcore. That's what I call quality commentary. I feel so bad for any kids whose dad bought them a Saturn and instead of Sega Rally, their dad got them this game because he likes to go mudding in his 4x4, or at least he likes watching it on his basic cable TV subscription. I can't imagine that household or any invited friends having a high opinion of the Saturn after playing this game. the incredible Sega Master System! Pop this bad boy in and defeat the Russian MiGs and save the world like a badass! Are your friends trying to tell you that the Master System isn't even as powerful as the ColecoVision? Then pop in F-16 Fighting Falcon and blow them away with real 3D graphics! Thrill to the amazing speed and realistic flight that only the power of the Sega Master System can bring you! F-16 Fighting Falcon on the Sega Master System is so incredibly awesome that one controller just won't do in this single play 
two-player game. That's right, you need to use two controllers simultaneously for this radical air combat adventure. Two controllers for twice the fun. You want a flight simulator so real that your face will be crushed like a pancake due to the extreme G-forces? Then pop in F-16 Fighting Falcon. Do rolls and loops and prove to those Russians that America isn't a nation of cowards. Why play Castlevania 3 when you can play F-16 Fighting Falcon instead? Want to play Mega Man 2 instead of F-16 Fighting Falcon? You're a freaking moron! You think Super Mario 3 is good? Wait till you see F-16 Fighting Falcon! Not only will the graphics melt your eyeballs, but your ears will catch on fire with the realistic sounds of a real F-16! So pop in F-16 Fighting Falcon into your Sega Master System and prove to your stupid idiot friends that they wasted their money on getting a Nintendo and tell them to go straight to hell! Now let's take a look at Hooters Road Trip for the PlayStation from Ubisoft. That's right, Hooters, the restaurant chain. And you know what everyone thinks of when they see Hooters. Yep, racing a generic car down generic roadways. What Hooters and racing have to do with each other is beyond me. But apparently Ubisoft felt like a Hooters license would really help this bland game out a ton. Basically, you drive your car from one location to the next, making sure you rank within the qualifying level. Once you make it to the finish line, one of several different full motion videos await you. Hey there, welcome to Jacksonville. Hi y'all, welcome to Georgia. How are you doing, sugar? That's right, they used the microphone built into the camcorder for this high quality production. If you succeed in the race, then it's on to the next stage, but at first there are only two stages. You then unlock a faster car, but you can't choose it for the road trip just yet. First, you need to license it by completing a track within a certain amount of time. Now you can continue the road trip with that car, but you have to start back from square one on the first stage. And now there are three stages to race on. You do this again and again, and each time you start the road trip from the beginning and more stages are tacked on. It's boring as hell. As you've probably noticed, the cars fishtail all over the place. It doesn't matter which car you choose, they all do it. Some are worse than others, but let's face it, there's no way you can play this game without looking like you're drunk. Uh, don't mind me, I'm just trying to make it to Hooters. <laughs> The cars with the fastest handling are absolutely frustrating to control. The red car has the slowest handling and therefore controls the best. But let's face it, you're still going to get pulled over and made to walk the line. You can choose to use analog control or digital control, but no matter which method I selected, I wanted to choose the other one immediately because I felt it must be better. Nope. It's bad no matter what. The graphics are simple, bland, and uninspired, but honestly, they could be a lot worse. There's no texture warping anywhere, nor is there any full screen dithering that covers everything. It also moves at a decent frame rate, so not too horrible. The music features some generic guitar, but once again, this is yet another game that for whatever reason is entirely in mono with no option to change to stereo. When it comes down to it, this game will make you think your controller is broken. If this was the first game I ever played using a DualShock 2, I think the controller was trash. Oh well, at least the loading screens are nice. This is one game where I really don't mind lengthy load times. I wonder, if you played this game while drunk, would it offset everything and suddenly the car feels like it controls normally? I'm not going to try, but let me know. Picture yourself actually liking baseball and loving the hell out of games like Tommy Lasorda Baseball on the Genesis or that Ken Griffey game on the Super Nintendo. Good stuff, right? Now imagine that you got a Nintendo 64 for Christmas and your grandma knows that you like baseball so she buys you Mike Piazza's Strike Zone. Wow, this game is pretty janky. The first time I played, I could only pitch no matter what team was up at bat. I could not take a swing for the life of me. Yes, that's right, I was pitching for both teams. 
It wasn't until I powered it off and then back on again that the game actually started working like you'd expect it to. Right off the bat, no pun intended, this game has a few issues or bugs. Anyway, your goal in this game is to hit the ball and score points on offense and catch the ball and tag runners out on defense. Pretty innovative. Hey! Okay, let's check out the graphics. Even for the Nintendo 64, they're pretty bad. The players are sparsely detailed at best, and it's even hard to make out the logos and the writing on their uniforms. But that's almost to be expected. Now, check out the animation of the players walking up to the plate. Yikes, that looks bad. And on the batter pitcher screen, you can't see any of the outfielders in the background. Literally, not even the second baseman. This makes it seem like the Nintendo 64 can barely put anything on the screen at all, and when it does, it's jerky as hell. Also, I don't know if this is a collision detection issue or what, but I clearly tagged this runner out, yet he's declared safe. Seriously, he was out! Maybe the umpires in this game are as blind as they are in real life. I'm sure that's the excuse the designers would use anyway. I will admit one thing that I really like about this game though, and that's that the C button arrows are mapped to each base of the diamond for quick and easy throws. But, as it turns out, that's not exactly original to this game, as Major League Baseball featuring Ken Griffey Jr. here does the same exact thing. So this definitely isn't a baseball game you want to use to show off the console, or even have a good time, really. voice hurts for some reason. I wonder why. <laughs> anyway, Sega did a much better job designing the Dreamcast than they did with the Saturn, so surely all of the third-party games would look outstanding now, right? Well, yeah, a lot of them did, actually. Not all of them, though, like these next two. How about Ducati World from Acclaim on the Sega Dreamcast? This motorcycle game seems to have blown most of its budget on the Ducati license. The game itself is quite average and certainly doesn't strive to be anything special. It only wants to meet the goals of the publisher at the most minimal level. You can do a single race or a whole tournament type of deal where you buy and sell bikes. You compete in different events depending on what type of motorcycle you have. There's nothing here tremendously new or exciting, even for its time. As you can see, the graphics are pretty simple with rudimentary polygons used for the racers and the track. Everything looks, well, boring. What's more is that the textures constantly redraw themselves as they approach the player. Look at that, it's extremely noticeable, especially in the tunnels where the updated higher resolution textures seem to have different lighting than the low res textures that they just replaced. Yeah. Not only that, but even the road seems to redraw itself from a jaggy mess into a smoother line sometimes. If this was your first experience with the Dreamcast back in the day, you probably wouldn't be very impressed with the machine as it really isn't much better than an average PlayStation 1 game. Even if these issues didn't exist and the graphics were really good, this still wouldn't be a very exciting game to play simply because it's, well, like I said, boring. How about Nightmare Creatures 2, also on the Dreamcast? This is a combination survival horror and hack and slash game published by Konami. You escape from your cell with a conveniently located axe and then make your way through the game chopping down gross creatures. What's even more gross is the quality of these graphics. Look how blocky all of these textures are. Everything looks exactly like a PlayStation game. And that's because this was originally on the PlayStation. The developers ported this game over to the Dreamcast and spent practically no effort on it. In the options, you can change the graphics quality from realistic to filtered. Filtered just basically applies a small amount of blur to everything except for the character graphics. It doesn't help much at all. I prefer realistic because I'm not a big fan of blurry graphics. If I were, I'd be a much bigger fan of the Nintendo 64. Ooh yeah, I went there. And I love how they call this mode realistic. Is this real or is it a game? I can't tell! Not only that, but look how goofy the animation is when you attack an enemy. Wow, that looks bad. 
Compared to the PlayStation version, there is far less texture warping and it even runs at a higher frame rate, but that's pretty much it. Even the audio has issues. It constantly has random pops, and the panning will hard shift for next to no reason whatsoever. No care went into the audio experience at all. As a game, it has potential. You run around and find stuff in order to progress further. But the controls could certainly be refined a little, and I wish everything weren't so dark. They could have tried so much harder on the Dreamcast version, but instead all we got was sloppy seconds. This certainly isn't a game that you'd use to impress your friends with the Dreamcast. Here's another stinker for the 3DO, and it's called Shadow, War of Succession from Tribeca Digital Studios. In this thrilling Mortal Kombat ripoff, you're prompted to choose from seven exciting characters. Did I say exciting? Because I meant unexciting. I actually rented this game back when it was new, and I think this may have been when I started thinking about selling my 3DO. Once you get to a stage, you try to play the game normally, and this is basically the result. Just look at how awful this looks. Oh, but that's not all. Oh no. It sounds just as bad as it looks. Listen. Every character has a winning personality with professionally recorded voice clips. My name is Erica Storm. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Wow. Somehow I like the Princess Bride a little less now. Thanks, Shadow War of Succession. Changing the game's difficulty seems to have no effect at all, and I'm not surprised considering how incomplete this entire package is. The computer AI will absolutely wreck you to pieces in no short order. And you can't just have a game over screen, oh no. The game throws this long FMV of scrolling text your way as if you care. Oh yeah, I want to read that, and look, it's not just scrolling text, it's full motion video. Color me impressed. Thank goodness this can actually be skipped, and I'm surprised it can be. The special moves are incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to pull off. I managed to do a couple once or twice, but it was purely by accident. I don't even remember how I did them. It turns out that playing this game like you'd normally play a fighting game isn't the best way to do it. You're supposed to crouch down in the corner and attack when the enemy comes near, occasionally blocking a projectile attack. This works to defeat almost every opponent. This game is a mess, and while the 3DO may not have set the world on fire, this game will make you think your console is broken at best. Let's wrap up this episode with a look at the mighty Neo Geo. This is an arcade system that played the exact same games at home. No changes. It was revolutionary for its time and expensive. In fact, we're talking $250 per game. Can you imagine paying $250 for any of these games? Can you? Huh? Neo Geo fans would have you believe that the Neo Geo is the best thing ever created by mankind with no weaknesses and unlimited power. Only pathetic homeless people don't own a Neo Geo. It really is a nice and welcoming community with friendly people. Of course, I'm being sarcastic. But there are a few games that make this machine look even worse than the mainstream home consoles it tried to compete against. And don't even tell me that the Neo Geo didn't try to compete with the Genesis and the Turbo Graphics because it did. First up is Legend of Success Joe by Wave. This at its heart is a crappy boxing game with bad controls and collision. You play as Joe and this is his legend. He needs you to help him become a success. Not only is this a crappy boxing game, but it's also a crappy beat-em-up. Basically, every stage starts with a poorly drawn beat-em-up where you need to defeat a few thugs or whatnot. 
Once you get past this, you're in the boxing ring fighting what I guess counts as the boss for that stage. Between each area is text explaining the story of the manga and anime which this game is based on. Since it's a boxing game, the controls are a bit more convoluted than they need to be which makes playing the game not fun at all. Even during the beat-em-up stages, you still need to use the same awkward controls which only use two buttons but require you to press them simultaneously for more powerful attacks. It's difficult to hit the enemies most of the time, but they have no issue at all reaching you. Anyway, look at the graphics. Just look at them. I've seen 8-bit games that look way better. Not necessarily in terms of how many colors are on screen or how big the sprites are, but just better artistic style and certainly much better animation. The graphics here can't even compare to the early Genesis game Buster Douglas Knockout Boxing. Everything in this game looks like it was drawn by someone who, well, probably shouldn't be drawing if I'm being honest. Each character has nearly 10 frames of animation, so try not to be blown away. Look, there's something you don't see on the Neo Geo every day, pixelated graphics. I've always admired the Neo Geo's ability to scale cleanly without resorting to ugly pixelization, but I guess they just wanted to have that ugly look here for some reason. Now, just listen to this game. Just listen to it, especially the music. It sounds worse than a low-memory Genesis game from 1989. Oh yeah, and all of this takes up 50 megs. That's kind of sad, actually. Imagine bringing over your friends to show them how much better the Neo Geo is compared to their crappy Sega, Nintendo, and NEC consoles which no self-respecting Neo Geo owner would ever dare play because they are so incredibly weak and unworthy. Your friends would beat you up, and you deserve it. And, since this was never released outside of Japan, that meant you'd have to import it which takes extra effort and cost, so you doubly deserve it. Next up is Riding Hero from SNK of America. This is one of the first releases for the Neo Geo. SNK decided that they needed a motorcycle racing game to compete in the arcades. This one doesn't even compete in the home market, much less in the arcade. The graphics are not well done at all, with a super thin road that has a rather odd movement of stripes which don't seem to be much affected by things like perspective. Other vehicles that happen to be driving around take up the entire road and are nearly impossible to get around. The WG mode takes you straight into racing. You go two laps around a track and attempt to finish in first place. Then you move on to the next track which looks almost exactly the same. Well the background is actually slightly different, but you might be hard pressed to tell at a glance. The road and the field beside it are always the same drab colors. Speaking of finishing in first place, check this out. I'm in first place, but the time runs out, which somehow knocks me back to eighth place. How did all of those other riders get ahead of me even though I was ahead of them? I mean, didn't the timer run out for them as well? What is the point of having a ranking system and a timer in a racing game? No need to leave a comment, I know that the answer is that it's an arcade game. I still think it's dumb though. The control in this one is odd. Since the Neo Geo doesn't have an analog wheel or handlebars, the longer you press a direction, the more you lean into it. If you let go of the joystick, your rider doesn't recenter himself, he stays put. It's odd, but you do get used to it after a little bit. There's also a story mode which tries to add a bit of meat to the game, but honestly I found it kind of annoying to play. You start by purchasing a bike, though you can't tell how much money you have as far as I was ever able to see. Then you bet on winning races against other riders. The backgrounds here add a bit of color, but the game still looks uninspired at best. It doesn't even look as good as Super Hang On on the pathetically weak Sega Genesis. It's not even in the same ballpark as the original arcade Hang-On which was released five whole years earlier. That's right, the Neo Geo can't even match Hang-On. At least that's what you'd think if you didn't know any better. I remember renting this game when I rented a Neo Geo console back in 1991 and I was thoroughly disappointed. I am laughing at you Neo Geo owners because the Neo Geo has Riding Hero. Oh wait, I own a Neo Geo myself. Now I feel bad.
The last game I want to talk about, at least briefly, is Burning Fight, also on the Neo Geo. Believe it or not, I actually don't hate this game as much as some other people do. I'm able to get some enjoyment out of this beat-em-up. The thing is, though, that it really doesn't seem much better than an average beat-em-up on the Super Nintendo at best. I mean, this is the Neo Geo! Any single game on this console should be better than every game combined on the Super NES, right? That's what SNK's edgy marketing led me to believe. Burning Fight is pretty average in most areas. The only thing they really seem to put much effort into is that a lot of the environment is destructible. But let's face it, this game is nowhere near on par with the likes of Streets of Rage 2. Hell, I'd much rather play Final Fight 2 or 3 than this. Still, this game isn't quite as bad as a lot of people make it out to be. It's just not on a level that you'd expect from the mighty Neo Geo. Well, there you go. A bunch of games that certainly could have tried a lot harder for the consoles they were on, don't you think? Do you have any examples of games that, you know, make the console look weak? Let me know. And look at me, I'm all pumped up now. I'm, you know, practically shouting and I'm moving around a lot more. And I was so stiff and boring and uninteresting in the beginning of this episode. I think that's what talking about the Neo Geo does to you. Thank you for watching GameSack. F-16 Fighting Falcon for the Sega Master System is one of the best games on the planet! But did you know that it's forward compatible with the Neo Geo? What? That's right! Check your Neo Geo collection, dumbass! You'd have to be a complete loser not to have F-16 Fighting Falcon! Combine the world's greatest game with the world's greatest game console and get ready to blow the Russians out of the sky! It's absolutely amazing! Whoa! Only F-16 Fighting Falcon for the Sega Master System on the Neo Geo gives you real dogfighting action! Yikes! Even flying a real F-16 in the Air Force is lame and way less realistic than playing it on the arcade quality Neo Geo! Super cool! If you're not prepared, you'll be shot down in flames! Hey, <laughs> toasted! Play F-16 Fighting Falcon for the Sega Master System on your Neo Geo today!